hello everybody and welcome to today's episode of the search podcast so for today's uh, episode i've wanted to talk about something that uh, a shows that i have no life uh, b uh, i find very important uh, especially at times like these and that's uh, the hippocratic oath or, or what we call the hippocratic oath uh, you know as you can see, with time, uh, there's been some evolution on how Hippocrates looked, and, and one would also think that same evolution, that same change from something that looks like this to a bust many, many years later, uh, to an engraving of a bust many, many years after that, uh, has also happened to the oath. And one of the things is that the truth about the Hippocratic Oath is that it, it has nothing to do with being a doctor. Right? It has nothing to do with being a nurse. It has something to do with being an apothecary. Because the term doctor was used at some point during the identification of the oath as, as written uh, canon, as part of the Hippocratic uh, corpus. Um, I prefer to use the term canon as opposed to corpus because that's how it was interpreted at that time. And the closest thing to a doctor would be an apothecary. There weren't multiple roles, there weren't division of labors within healthcare, and healthcare and medicine was not a science at that point, or not, not a mature science. Nothing really was. Philosophy was the mainstay. Uh, I would urge anybody to read more about Galen to begin to develop an understanding uh, of how medicine went from being the oldest philosophical construct uh, into becoming one of the youngest sciences. And the truth is that this is an oath that is taken by healthcare workers, not by doctors necessarily. The identification of it as a doctor's oath only happened at a time before we had the division of labor that we do now within medicine. Um, throughout the years, uh, everybody's made up an addition to it. Uh, the Germans rediscovered it in the 1500s and decided that this would be used to identify doctors as good or bad. It was then translated to English and incorporated in Western medicine. And uh, after that, the World Medical Association, which is now sort of turned into the WHO, decided that all medical schools should use it. And then it was uh, rewritten by uh, Louise Lasagna to be adopted by those medical schools around about the 1960s. So it, it, doctors stole that oath from all other healthcare workers, a little bit selfishly, but they stole it at a time when in the 1960s, we were trying to build a more scientific professional identity than we had ever seen before. And I think it was important at that time. But the most important thing to understand is, with this history, he didn't write it. He collected scraps of paper, and he wrote the first textbook, you could say, called the Hippocratic Cor Corpus. It included different articles that were transcribed over different years and uh, transcribed over generations even, with very limited accuracy overall and you know that's what led to the modern oath that we have today the earliest one that seems to be complete is the one that's in the vatican and it's heavily influenced by christian culture it's the one that tells us not to do abortions it's the one that tells us uh, first do no harm in a very latin way and things like that and the reason why i use the word latin way is because although it was written in uh, greek it was translated to Latin very quickly, and the type of Greek that the people were writing was very much not the colloquial or professional Greek of the time. It was a heavily influenced, quite westernized Latin type of Greek. However, the oldest version of it that was written and identified as part of the Hippocratic Oath is around about the 3rd century AD. Okay, and, and when you look at the earliest version, and that small scrap that is almost inconsequential, and when you extend yourself out a little bit, you imagine that there are different medical oaths that were taken by different medical people that would eventually be identified as physicians and doctors, as opposed to scientists. You know that, that by first the translations were a bit off. Uh, it's an Ionic versus Coin Greek situation, so a lot of the time People thought that what they were doing was correct, but they were being heavily influenced by Latin concepts of that time, especially around about the third century. The second is that if you extend your criteria out a little bit, 
there is evidence that it was written or there was a physician's oath prior to Hippocrates, around about the 4th or the 5th BC, and that it was adapted by Hippocrates. Right? Um, do no harm as a phrase is actually an extremely new thing. I apologize, I'm on call, these things happen. Uh, I keep getting texts and things. It's a pretty new thing, all right? It's a Latin thing, primum non nocere. It means I will abstain from all intentional wrongdoing and harm. It was even retranslated slightly differently in the epidemics, uh, book one of the Hippocratic School, where, uh, you know, it was the same sentence was paraphrased to practice two things in your dealings with disease, either help or do not harm the patient. And the exact phrase is probably, the phrase do no harm, is probably a very English phrase uh, from Thomas Inman. It was probably sort of retroactively turned into other things. And when, when you just take that do no harm, that, that one sentence, and you try and trace it back through, you realize that the intent is what counts here. So in, in, in certain uh, societies and at certain times, uh, do no harm was interpreted as no abortions and no palliative care. And so what ended up happening was as part of Hippocratic canon that was translated and taught in medical schools, and in some cases as the basis of the attitude of the science of medicine, genuinely tried to stop us uh, from uh, doing uh, things that could be therapeutic potentially, that could have a therapeutic intent to them under the do not harm banner. This even included not using a knife. Uh, every medical expert that I've talked to who quote unquote understands Hippocrates tells me that Hippocrates was against using the knife. He, in fact, was not. If you read the whole corpus, there are contradicting parts of the corpus. Lithotomies are described using specific knives. How to fashion the knives was described, right? And the reason why they added, do not use a knife, was because at one point, around about the Middle Ages, surgical outcomes were extremely poor. And it was felt very strongly that surgery should be split from medicine. And that did happen. Physicians refused to, to perform surgical techniques. As we all know, we adapted from barbers. We adapted the surgical discipline from, from uh, barber's trade. And to this day, I would argue that the best way to teach surgery is as an apprenticeship and a mentorship. I think that you can produce an extremely solid surgeon about four to five years, in my humble opinion. But I think that those four to five years have to be very intense oversight. And in fact, the Hippocratic Corpus does include notes on how to educate and who to educate. And you can't make the argument to not use the knife to heal when on literally three pages later you get this in the same place. And this is a clear um, operative manual on how to operate on somebody and perform a lithotomy. I, I, I could provide a verbatim translation, but it's not worth it. In my humble opinion, having read the different variations of this, the clearest Ionic Greek interpretation has to be, do not intend to do harm. Intent is what counts, right? It also means do what you know is appropriate, but take ownership of what you've done. And I think that that's something that we need to take home as a, as a medical profession, not just physicians. Intent is what the Hippocratic Oath and the Hippocratic Corpus is about. Ownership is mentioned multiple times by Hippocrates, in this and in other books, either written by him or by proxy, we know that we should be better at ownership. Hippocrates made it very clear through his own writings that he felt a very strong attachment and relationship to his fellow medical workers at the time and to people outside of medicine who he had treated. He had genuinely felt that there should be some identity for that doctor-patient relationship. And no matter what version you look at, the fact that there are different versions of, of, of what we now feel strongly identifies us as, as physicians, although I would argue it identifies us as healthcare workers, it, it, it's a living document. And it's a living document that we should take care of and we should nurture. The original Ionic Greek is probably closest to the following. Abstain from what is deleterious and mischievous. And that's the spirit of this living document, in my humble opinion. 
we've added and taken out things, but we need to remember, you are dealing with a living document that represents our professional values. History will remember the changes that you've made to this document, which you have every right to do. Uh, an oath is not an oath in this sense, when you're talking about the Hippocratic Oath, if it does not represent you as a profession. It should represent our values as healthcare workers to do the right thing, to train people in the right way. When, when somebody tells me that it tells physicians not to divulge secrets, the Ionic Greek paraphrasing, you can smell it all over there if you know anything about Greek, which I know very little about. This is like, for me, this is bedtime reading. I don't, it's not something that, that I'm extremely passionate about. But if you, if you understand the actual Greek and Latin, you will understand that when they say not to divulge secrets, what they really mean is don't tell everybody how to do something in a fast food manner. Make sure that you train them first. You have to become a part of the medical community in order for me to teach you medicine. Take ownership of your decisions and represent your profession in your community. This is a part that almost everybody forgets. The only thing that I hear people say is do no harm. But people and, and misinterpretations that annoy me uh, because I'm a very big fan of Hippocrates in general and I would recommend reading these books because they give you some background on, on how he never cared about being identified as the best physician in the world. He never cared about being the, 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 the reason why we have the profession. He cared about providing a service, providing a community, and building what was once a philosophical paradigm into a do, an act. And when you, when you do go into more depth in the, in the philosophy of that time, particularly the transitions between you know, different stages of thought, I would, uh, is the best way of me putting it, um, it it's, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, you see that, that this was a time period when we were seeing physicians become philosophers, philosophers become physicians, understanding and doing becoming part and parcel of each other. And, and this, uh, this sort of tandem design of thought, right, where, uh, you, you know, everything is opened up and everything is understood. I think that that's the spirit of what Hippocrates tried to say with the whole corpus, which is available publicly for free on Google, by the way. Uh, if you're not bored yet, um, please subscribe. Uh, you can use the QR codes and please comment and like on YouTube if you can and on iTunes. Uh, it helps us out a lot. Um, I've been getting some really good feedback all over. Um, if you like these types of episodes where we talk a little bit more historical and philosophical, uh, please let me know. If you prefer stuff that's more clinical, I'm also okay with that. And this is Saud Al-Zaid, and thank you for listening.